Hello and welcome to Ithaca DSA Presents. I'm Teresa Alt. Let me just introduce a little bit of the background. Over the past eight or so years, we have heard several times from Ithacans who visited the border, mostly together with SOA Watch and mostly to Nogales in Arizona, a city that is paired with Nogales in Mexico. But now um, we're going to be speaking with Caitlin Blanchfield, an Ithaca DSA member who has been doing some research in an area not all that far from Nogales, but a little to the west. And the earlier visitors mentioned a an Indian reservation on the border. Um, and I'm not quite sure of, of the pronunciation. Tohono. The pronunciation is Tohono Otham. Say that again. Tohono Otham. Uh-huh. Okay. Um so it kind of rhymes with Gotham, yeah. I guess. Uh, and tell tell us, what were you doing there, Caitlin Blanchfield? Um, hi, thanks, Teresa and Ithaca DSA Presents for, um, for having me on the show. Um, so I've been working on the Tohono O'odham Nation off and on with, with two collaborators since 2015, um, and one of those collaborators, Ophelia Rivas, um, is a Tohono O'odham tribal elder and activist who lives um, just a quarter mile from, from the U.S.-Mexico border. And the other one is a, um, an architect and human rights lawyer, um, or not lawyer, legal scholar named uh, Nina Valerie Kolarotnik. Um, and we have been working to, um, to identify um, diagram and make public the impact of surveillance infrastructure that's be that um, well when we began this project was proposed to be built and um, subsequently has been built along the U.S. Mexico border, which actually goes through Tohono O'odham land. Um, and so I'm sure. Uh, listeners and, and viewers to this program will be familiar with the U.S.-Mexico border region. Um, and as you were saying, talk to people who have visited Nogales. And so the area that um, I've been working in is to the west of Nogales. Uh, it's close to the city of Tucson. Um, but this is a Native American reservation that um, one of its boundaries is the, or its southern boundary is the U.S.-Mexico border, but Tohono O'odham lands, you know, span across the border. So there are Tohono O'odham people who live in Mexico, um, who have tribal IDs, and um, are supposed to be able to use those to travel back and forth, uh, you know, into the Tohono O'odham reservation on the U.S. Um, and so what we initially began this project um, because of proposed what were called integrated fixed surveillance towers um, that in 2014 were being proposed to be built along the U.S.-Mexico border, as well as on a border between the reservation and a national park or national monument called the Organ Pipe Cactus National Monument um, which is to the west of the reservation. So there are gonna be 16 of these towers all together. Um, and there was an environmental impact statement saying that they would not have any, um, any impact on the land, on the wildlife, on the people 
uh, who live there. And um, this was around the time that my uh, collaborator, Nina, and I met Philia. And through speaking with her and speaking with um, her neighbors and friends in the community where she lives, it became very obvious that, in fact, that this was not the case, that um, these like gigantic surveillance towers would indeed have a lot of impact um, on people who lived near where they were being proposed to, to be built. So at that point, we began a project to identify some basic information about the towers, such as where they would be located, what the technologies um, that would comprise them would be, um, and what the reach of those technologies um, would be in terms of uh, their the sort of radius of their surveillance technologies. Um, but then also to really think about what the impact of having these towers built would be for the the land, for the wildlife, um, and for you know, the indigenous people to that land um, then in the Tohonotham Nation. Uh, so that's what, what brought me down there. Okay. I have a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, one is what United States agency is involved or agencies? Um, yeah, that's a that's a good question. So this is uh, U.S. Customs and Border Pro uh, Protection, CBP. Okay. And also, when you talk about a tower, how high would a tower be? Or are they different heights? Um, 180 feet high. Okay, 180 so, feet. So that's like 18, 20 stories. Yeah, it's... Um, or, Hmm. It might be that it's, I'm pretty sure it was 180. It might be 80. I'm I'm going to have to uh, double check now because when you say 18 stories, that, that does sound very high. So I'm going to double check that, that fact, but. Okay. You can tell me I can add it at the end. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, I mean, they're, they're very high. Uh, so the it's basically like a kind of a scaffold that hosts uh, different uh, cameras, radar, microwave detectors. So it goes very high into the air. Um, and then on top, there's this kind of suite of uh, surveillance technologies attached to it that are then able to um, detect moving vehicles, uh, moving bodies, you know, infrared cameras. Um, and so the idea is that the height gives them a, um, you know, a vaster radius onto the landscape. And this is in an area that um, is mountainous. So they're also placed um, strategically either in high, lo high elevation locations or in places uh, that would be difficult for border patrol um, vehicles to, to navigate. So it is in a way a kind of mechanization of what human border patrols might be doing in other places. Yes. Um, so, you know, the this was developed um, and, and actually some of the first, it's tested basically on this reservation. Um, and so this is kind of a continuation of using, of the U.S. government using indigenous lands to as kind of testing grounds. Um, since this was proposed and has been implemented, they are also starting to implement this technology um, in other places in Arizona. But basically it's designed for um, yeah, environments that are more uh, remote and challenging uh, to surveil through um, yeah, with vehicles. Um, and this is the result of an effort to, um, and maybe some of your guests who had been to Nogales mentioned this, to kind of funnel migration from major ports of entry into remote desert locations um, that are more difficult and more dangerous to cross. So policies from um, the 1990s that sought to um, really clamp down on migration through cities uh, and then funnel which the result was to funnel migrants uh, to more, you know, dangerous desert regions um, that are more difficult to navigate. And so that's kind of why 
uh, there was more uh, surveillance equipment being brought to this region, um, but the surveillance equipment also does come with more border patrol. And so this was another thing that we were um, trying to demonstrate through the um, both the mapping and the um, what we ended up creating was an alternative or a counter environmental impact statement was to show that, you know, a, the tower actually came with a lot more than its own physical imprint came with, well, not only the, you know, construction crews and all the roads that had to be built and equipment to construct these, um, these physical structures, but then actually comes with more border patrol who are then um, in the area to monitor or to follow up on anything that might be detected uh, through the cameras. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you again mentioned Nogales, and I remember that, you know, from pictures from there, there's a wall there, a considerable wall. Yeah. Is there a wall here too? There's not a wall. There's there's a fence, though. Uh -huh. So um, there's no wall. And at the time that we started this, the, there wasn't a wall um, in the National Park region either. Like that region was um, fenced off. It's kind of like these large uh, steel bollards and then um, cables kind of going between it. Um, so, I mean, that fencing already has an impact, um, an impact for the migration of, of wildlife who have to navigate going through the fence. Um, you know, in the construction of the fence, it was disruptive to um, the, the saguaro cactus, which is a unique cactus to that region. Um, and the creation of this fencing came with um, the creation of three official border crossings on the reservation. So it made it extremely difficult for Tohonawatham people to go back and forth between communities that are in Arizona and Mexico, and that they would have to um, go through a checkpoint to do this. Whereas um, before, I mean, this kind of all happened after 9-11. So whereas before you could move quite fluidly through this area. Um, now there's uh, checkpoints. And so the the towers are just kind of part of this um, accretion of different measures of um, well, basically like militarization um, and policing of the border. And I think you said that you wanted to study how it impacted the indigenous communities, and I guess on both sides of the border. And so how does it impact them? Yeah, um, so that was definitely the the aim of this, uh, this collaborative research project, which involved um, a lot of, you know, just going and, and talking with community members who lived in the, the village of Ali Jek, which is the village that our Collaborator Ophelia lives with lives in, which is uh, where one of these towers is proposed, as well as some other communities near proposed towers. Um, and you know, we hear a lot about the U.S. Mexico border, and you know, through of course the Trump presidency, uh, through the Biden presidency, you know, all of these really violent policies around migration. Um, and, you know, seeing every day in the media really violent, you know, pictures of, of the conditions of migrants crossing the border. But I think what can be overlooked in that conversation is the impact of the border militarization on Indigenous communities whose lands span the border. Um, and so in the case of the Tohono O'odham Nation, as I was saying, you know, I mean, it's made it ex extremely difficult to move across the border um, between communities so that this is meant, um, you know, it's really hard for family members um, to see each other. It, it went from, you know, being able to drive 10 minutes to now having to go a very circuitous three hour route um, for tribal members who live in Mexico. Um, they are often denied entry with tribal ID or are deported. Um, and it's also, I mean, it's really just meant a larger presence of Customs and Border Protection, of Border Patrol agents 
on the reservation, um, which has led to harassment of trial tribal members. Um, you know, it's I think very commonplace for tribal members to get pulled over um, and questioned. And there was a, a really tragic incident um, a couple of months ago where um, Raymond Matia, who lives in the village of Ali Jack, had called um, for actually for assistance from Border Patrol when he um, heard people in his in his yard uh, in the middle of the night. And when the Border Patrol came, they you know they shot and killed him. And so the the, the scale of of her of violence goes from you know daily harassment to real um to you know loss of life and and people being killed by the border patrol um and in terms of the towers specifically that we were looking at um the impacts range from you know invasion of privacy having your you know backyard basically being filmed all the time to also impacts on Tohono O'odham traditional um, way of life and ceremony. So um, we were told about ceremonies that were disrupted because of uh, border patrol moving through. The fact that many ceremonies that are supposed to be, you know, secret are now being observed by these surveillance towers, and that they are, and they have a huge impact on the land. Um, and this is something that's very concerning to. Uh, community members is the way that they're constructed. They have really s- deep foundations that drill deep into this landscape, in, and some are in places that are considered sacred. Um, so they're just very damaging to the land itself. Um, and there's a lot of fears that uh, this will also disrupt wildlife. Um, and there was a sense in reading through this environmental impact statement that there actually wasn't any studies done to see what would the impact of the construction be or of the, um, you know, like the microwave emitters and some of these technologies on a lot of the animals in the in the area. Um, uh, an endangered bat in that region that people were worried about. So it really affects, you know, kind of across the spectrum of the plants, the animals, you know, the people. Has there been any documentation of effects on animals or plants? Um, so not, well, there's been documentation kind of more like grassroots uh, photographs of just the way that construction has resulted in the, a lot of like uprooting of of plants and, and saguaro cactus, which they're really not supposed to be um, uh touching at all because they're protected. Um, and I know that the Center for Biolo- the Center for Biological Diversity has done a lot of documentation, the impact of like border wall and border um, infrastructure in general on endangered species. Um, so I know that this was also a concern of, of that organization and of environmental groups as well. Um, but there haven't been uh, you know, scientific studies done. I'm wondering whether there have been changes in the process of, well, planning and constructing these towers over time and how that relates over time to different federal administrations. Yeah, I mean, that's like- Good question. And so when we started this, it was in uh, 2015. Um, And then after Trump was elected, there was the push to build the wall, right? Um, So this, the towers were proposed under the Obama administration. Um, the, The threat of the wall I think accelerated their construction because the tribal government was faced with this choice basically of approve the towers um, or, you know, the wall will come. Um, 
and the tribal government has has pushed back a lot against um well the construction of the wall definitely um they're very much on the record really speaking out against that um but also in a i think a difficult position because the US government even though it's a sovereign indigenous government the US government can override that for national security um there's also a law that you know within it's 20 feet of the border they have kind of um eminent domain anyway so i think the the sort of the specter of the wall being built accelerated these towers being approved um but their construction you know continued after trump left office um so you know, in that sense, there hasn't really been a, a ramping down at all of the presence of um, border patrol or construction of different of either these towers or other technologies that are used um, to apprehend people crossing the border. Well, I think we're hearing that in a lot of border situations that Biden's administration essentially continues the Trump work. Yes. Yeah. And this is another example of that. Absolutely. And what were you hoping to achieve by mapping this infrastructure and its effects? So our initial goal was to create a set of documents that could be used to advocate um, on the level of the um, the district. So uh, within the Tohonotham Nation, there are different districts and this, we were working in Guvo district. So advocate within Guvo district and to the tribal government about the um, effects of these towers. So the environmental impact assessment that uh, was released that said there was no impact. Um, you know, we and those we spoke with felt that it was, um, you know, uh, did not present the depth of impact, you know, on, on several levels, one of which just being basic information about um, how far the, you know, the cameras would be able to see the types of things they would be able to detect where specifically they would be located, but also what the impact would be um, within the Tohono O'odham understanding of the landscape um, and how tribal members use the landscape. So this was why we were doing a lot of interviews with people who lived in the area to understand um, you know, how they would be impacted in a way that an environmental impact statement or assessment um, wouldn't even consider. So thinking about, um, you know, the ceremonial cycles, um, thinking about I think just more general kind of uh, well-being um, and relationship to the land that all of a sudden, you know, people were not feeling comfortable and safe out on the land anymore. Um, and so we wanted to, to map the, uh, you know, the actual extent of where the towers would be, what their surveillance uh, radii would be, but also kind of overlay that with information about um, where particular uh, medicinal plants are, where particular habitats of important animals were, um, areas where uh, important ceremonies would occur. And we wanted to show this um, in a way that would convey the impact without also giving, you know, specific information about where specific ceremony happens or something that, um, you know, would not be appropriate to make public, but to in to show you know really the extent to which all aspects of life would be um, harmed by the construction of these towers. So we presented the maps and our own report to um, the district government, who then voted against the tower approving the towers as well as to the tribal government. Um, but as I said, I 
I think in response to just, you know, the the real pressure from CBP and particularly in, in the climate of Trump and the wall uh, did end up approving their construction. So since then, um, we've, you know, still been publishing this information and are working on a publication now to, you know, raise awareness about um, the specific uh, infrastructure, these specific towers, because as I said, they're sort of tested and prototyped here, but will be deployed also elsewhere on the border. Um, but also to raise, you know, uh, the conversation about the impacts of militarization, border militarization on indigenous lands um, to continue to educate uh, you know, the, both the local kind of public on the Tohono O'odham Nation about um, these towers so that there can continue to be pressure maybe to take them down in the future, uh, but also to, you know, have a, a resource for others who might be uh, opposing them in, in their own location. Okay, so it is perhaps not so much that unwelcome and I think it sounds to me like essentially at the grassroots level, they are unwelcome. Uh, yeah. That unwelcome towers could be removed here, at least not very soon, but that perhaps other places might be able to resist. Yes, yes. Um, and I think the the goal is both that to in the the, the towers, uh, you know, could be removed. Like we've seen border constructions taken down. We've, you know, like there was the whole shipping container thing in Arizona where they like tried to build the wall with shipping containers and took that down. So there's definitely precedent for removing. Yeah. Well, um, that was state, yeah. right? That was the yeah. state doing something, not the feds. Yes, that was the state. But I think, yeah, now the, more immediate um, goal is really just to kind of uh, raise the conversation in other places and, and other um, venues outside of the communities most directly affected. Yeah. Well, thank you, Caitlin Blanchfield. This has been a lot of interesting information about what is going on on the border. This is Ithaca DSA Presents. I'm Teresa Alt. Thanks for watching. One, two, one, two, three.